Allow me to set the scene. The year is 1744. We find ourselves in Williamsburg, Virginia. The city was named after King William III of England. In Williamsburg, there is a college named William and Mary, named after King William III and Queen Mary II of England. It's a very old college. It was around in 1744. The college sent a letter to what was called the Six Nations, or the Iroquois Confederacy. This confederacy was a collection of several, uh, several Native American tribes, such as the Mohawk tribe. So the College of William and Mary sent a letter to the Iroquois Confederacy inviting them to send their young men to the college for what the college called a proper education. The response to this invitation from the Iroquois Confederacy reads as follows. Sirs, we know that you highly esteem the kind of learning taught in colleges and that the maintenance of our young men while with you would be very expensive to you. We are convinced, therefore, that you mean to do us good by your proposal, and we thank you heartily. But you, who are wise, must know that different nations have different conceptions of things, and you will therefore not take it amiss if our ideas of this kind of education happen not to be the same with yours. We have had some experience of it. Several of our young people were formerly brought up at the colleges of the northern provinces. They were instructed in all your sciences, but when they came back to us, they were bad runners, ignorant of every means of living in the woods, unable to bear either cold or hunger, knew neither how to build a cabin, take a deer, or kill an enemy, spoke our language imperfectly, were therefore neither fit for hunters, warriors, nor counselors, they were totally good for nothing. We are, however, not the less obliged by your kind offer, though we decline accepting it, and to show our grateful sense of it, the gentlemen of Virginia will send us a dozen of their sons, we will take care of their education, instruct them in all we know, and make men of them." End quote. Obviously, both groups had different expectations about what makes a well-rounded adult in their societies. The Iroquois nation said, actually, uh, we don't like the education you provide for young men. If you send us some of your young men, though, uh, we will make men of them. I think the College of William and Mary was not expecting such a response. Well, in today's text, we will see how God exceeded everyone's expectations during the death of Christ. There are seven miracles and great acts in our text today. I don't think anyone was expecting them, just as the College of William and Mary was not expecting such a response from the Iroquois nation, or Iroquois Confederacy. J.C. Ryle comments on the expectations that the crowd had at the cross by saying this, The Roman soldiers and the gaping crowd around the cross saw nothing remarkable. They only saw a person dying as others died, with all the usual agony and suffering which attend a crucifixion. But they knew nothing of the eternal interests which were involved in the whole transaction. So then, let us begin by examining the crowd, and uh, let's try to understand their mindset, and see what they were expecting. At this point in our text, Christ has been suffering for a while, and is about to perish. And in verse 46, he cries out, you know, pardon me because I'll butcher this, but, Eli, Eli, lemma shabbatani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? in the Aramean language, which was a language of the common people. How did the crowd react to this? They mocked Christ with what he said. Look at verse 47, it says, And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. Now because some of the words of Christ sounded like Elijah, namely the beginning of what he said, Eli, Eli, kind of, it kind of sounds like Elijah. 
And because they were filled with scorn, they mocked Jesus with his own words. Calvin said, They deliberately intended to mock Christ and turn his prayer into an occasion of slander. And of course they did. They had been mocking him consistently up to this point. Why would they change now? After Jesus refused to drink the ver, uh, excuse me, after Jesus refused to drink uh, the uh, vinegar drink that was offered to him in verse 48, the people said this in verse 49: "Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him." So you can see the continued mockery in such a statement. I'd like to make a comment about the attitude of the crowd. This constant mockery from the crowd was not only an aspect of the suffering of Christ, but also an example of the world's attitude towards Christianity. Our religion is mocked in the world and has been for centuries. Whenever you see a Christian depicted in the media, they're either some kind of outright bigot or an ignorant dinosaur of a bygone era. This really speaks to the depravity of mankind. The crowd mocked the Son of God as he died on the cross. An innocent man. It's in this era's new edition of unbelievers. Those who live in today's age really do the same kind of thing. Our text shows us the level of malice and disregard the unregenerate often have toward our faith. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. That is, they are foolishness to him. And he, the unregenerate person, the unbeliever, is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The person who has not been born again cannot understand the gravity and the weight of the gospel. They cannot understand spiritual things because these things are discerned spiritually. And doesn't this scene at the cross prove what 1 Corinthians 2.14 is saying to be true? People aren't able to grasp the things of God by themselves, and that's why they need God to intervene in their lives and change their heart so that they can believe. They can see the Messiah crucified in front of them and still not believe. <coughs> they need God working in their hearts. Well, we can see that the crowd of mockers did not expect what was going to happen. In our text today, we can see several miracles or great acts. I say great acts because not all the seven happenings are miracles, but uh, they are great things and worthy of note, yet some of the seven are outright miracles. I won't be telling you which ones, uh, which, which of those are or are not miracles. I'll let you decide for yourself, but there are seven Noteworthy things that happened in this text. And certainly the crowd was not expecting any of these. We'll work through these seven as they appear in our text. Let's first look at the darkness in verse 45. Uh, verse 45 says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. The sixth hour was noon. And the ninth hour was three in the afternoon. So we can say that for three hours in the middle of the day, there was a great darkness in the area. That fact alone is remarkable. You imagine if this afternoon, after the service, you went outside and the sky was dark. It remained dark for about three hours. I think we would be a little unnerved by such a development. But what do we learn what can we take away from the darkness of that area, uh, the darkness of the sky in, in that area on Golgotha? The darkness is an emblem of the sufferings of Christ. Charles Simeon commented on this and said, under such circumstances, what in the compass of created nature could so fitly represent his sufferings as the event before us, or to put it plainly, what else could have happened to better express what was happening? What else could have happened nature-wise to show us the importance of what was going on? Just as the Son of God was dead for three days, the sun of the sky was blotted out for three hours. 
the wrath of God was poured out on Christ. He was bearing our sins on the cross. He was drinking down our hell. And the sky is dark to tell us of the gravity of such a situation. Interestingly enough, there's an entire psalm that speaks to the darkness that Christ endured in those moments. If you're familiar with it, you know that its tone is one of misery and despair. Speaking of Psalm 88, Many psalms end with an uplifting message about how God can deliver us, but not this one. Psalm 88 ends in verse 18 by saying this in the CSB version, You have distanced loved ones and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. And if you read Psalm 88, that's how a lot of it reads. This is a messianic psalm. Not directly messianic, but... There are messianic elements of it. We can conclude then that the darkness in the sky was used by God to point us to Christ and the significance of this event. The same goes for the second event, which is the fulfillment of messianic prophecy, direct messianic prophecy. We talked at great length last week about how the crucifixion of Christ fulfilled centuries-old prophecy, most notably from Psalm 22. Remember, we went through that. We talked about uh, many verses from Psalm 22. Well, in a few of these verses in today's text, we have a bit more of that messianic prophecy. In fact, we have three to look at today. As we mentioned last week, Psalm 22 could be thought of the crucifixion psalm, as it contains many details about the death of Christ on the cross. Yet it was written hundreds of years before that event happened. And are you familiar with how Psalm 22 opens? Does anyone know how Psalm 22 begins? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Psalm 22.1. The very words in Matthew 27.46 were written by David in a psalm that tells us all about Christ's death. It should reveal to us, as does the rest of Psalm 22, that Christ's death was planned by God and was of great significance. We see Christ abandoned by God, treated as if he were a sinner. We see this described in Psalm 22. We also read last week about how Christ was offered gold to drink. This fulfilled Psalm 69, 21. Instead they gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. We saw the goal last week, but what about the vinegar that's also mentioned in that verse? Well, Christ was offered vinegar in today's text. In verse 48 we read, And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. This is the second part of Psalm 69, 21's fulfillment. Again, this was designed to show us the importance of the death of Christ. You can find all these verses in the Old Testament about Christ on the cross, and very small details as well. These messianic prophecies, a lot of them are very specific. They're not general, they're specific about little elements of the crucifixion, such as the vinegar. And now we come to Matthew 27, 50, which says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Well, here's a question. What did Christ cry out? What were the words that he said? We don't have it in Matthew's Gospel. But this moment of Christ's surrendering was recorded in Luke 23, 46. It tells us what Christ said as he yielded up his spirit. That verse says, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. These words, as well, can be seen in the Psalms. Isn't that remarkable? Psalm 31, 5 says, Into your hand I commit my spirit, and no doubt what Christ said reflected this verse. We can see so much of the Old Testament and the crucifixion and death of Christ. It's really remarkable. Here we can see Christ suffering unimaginable punishment for crimes that he did not commit, which 
which were the plan of God, yet still submitting himself to God. This should show us the humility of Christ. And as his followers, we need this level of humility as well. When we suffer, when times are bad, we have no right to complain and be bitter. Christ suffered far greater than we ever will, and he didn't complain. He committed himself to God. We need to commit ourselves to God's plan as well. Now, did anyone in the crowd expect verses from the Psalms that were written centuries before that day to be, uh, to be fulfilled as they watched Christ die? I highly doubt it. I highly doubt the Jews would have thought such a thing would occur. They, they hated him. They didn't think that he was the Messiah. Why would they think that prophecy about the Messiah would be fulfilled by him? And did the Romans expect great things on this day? No. They weren't even familiar with the scriptures. This was just another day of work for the Roman guard. Nobody saw this coming. And nobody saw the fulfillment of prophecy coming. Excuse me. And if nobody saw the fulfillment of prophecy coming, they certainly didn't see the rest of these events coming. And we come to the third event described in our text. We see it in Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now remember, the crucifixion took place outside of town. We talked about that last week. The crucifixion was far away from the temple. Yet, something significant happened in the temple. When Christ died, something changed. And it was symbolized in the tearing of this curtain. So let's ask, what regularly happened in the temple? Sacrifices. And who were these sacrifices to? They were to God. Yet Hebrews 10.4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see, all the sacrifices in the temple were a shadow, if you will, of the true sacrifice that was to come. The sacrifices of animals held back the wrath of God until the true sacrifice came and satisfied the justice of God. That true sacrifice, of course, is Jesus Christ who died for our sins. Now, do Christians go to buildings called temples anymore? No. We do not meet in temples. We do not go to temples for any kind of religious service. Do we sacrifice animals? No, we don't. And do you realize what this means? This means the sacrifice of Christ ushered in a new era of religion. The era of the temple sacrifice was now over. Furthermore, and more importantly, Christ's sacrifice accomplished our forgiveness as our sins were placed on Christ and his righteousness is credited to us. Thus, Ending the whole uh, temple system. What a wonderful thing it is that Colossians 2 describes. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the circumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him. Having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Here you see congregation that. Our sin was done away with at the cross. And the curtain, again, was torn. But how was it torn? It was torn from top to bottom to show us the hand of God reaching down from heaven to mankind to extend grace and everlasting life to us. Was anyone expecting the ushering in of a new religious system on that day? No, I don't think so. Also in verse 51, we see something else. It says, And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. This is the fourth event, the earthquake. The sky bore testimony to the death of Christ. Its dark clouds pointed us to his sufferings. How fitting then that the earth shook violently as he died, telling us the magnitude of such an event. It was such a violent event that the rocks were split. Which again speaks to the seriousness of this, uh, this event. The fifth event is seen in verses 52 and 53. 
Those verses say, The tombs were also opened. Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. What a sight that must have been. I know that these two verses raise a, a multitude of questions in our minds. Like, what happened to the people um, that came out of the tombs and were testifying in the city? What happened after they were done testifying? Where did they go? And uh, why only some people in that part of the world? And why did they only go to Jerusalem? We could spend a lot of time speculating and asking questions, but I'd like to stick with uh, what we know for sure for the sake of time and clarity. Speaking of clarity, I'd like to clarify a detail here. You'll notice in our text that the tombs were open at this point of the story, but the people in the tombs were not resurrected until after Christ was resurrected. Uh, the text says, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city. Why, why was that? Well, other than the purpose of having those uh, who rose testify about Christ, the people came out of the tombs to show us that we are united in Christ, sharing in his resurrection. After three days, Christ was resurrected. And then the believers of old, too, were resurrected. This is a picture of what awaits us, congregation. The death of this body is not the end. We will be raised. We will be united with Christ in heaven. We will be resurrected. We suffer with him. We die with him. And we are resurrected with him. How glorious a thing to consider. And we come to the sixth event. We have so many things to talk about here in this text. So many miraculous things and great and big things. The sixth event, the confessions of the centurion and the others. Look at verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. Do you think those people woke up that morning and thought, I think today is the day that I will be convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. Of course they didn't. But this realization from a Roman of all people speaks volumes about how blind the religious community was at the time. The heathen, the Romans, realized who Jesus was. But the crowd of religious Jews who were so familiar with the Old Testament did not. This would be like an atheist coming to a church on a Sunday, hearing the preached word and having a moment of realization. Yet the regular attendees of that church continue in their, uh, in their disbelief, never actually grasping the basics of the faith, only pretending to be believers and putting on a show of religion for social acceptance. Seventh and finally, we come to the, uh, the women who were gathered there in verses 55 and 56. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, for clarification, if you check the other Gospels and figure out who's the mother of who, this ends up being Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and... Uh, the mother of James and John, uh, or the sons of Zebedee. Now you might come to these verses and disregard them as mere footnotes. Who cares, you may ask. You might also be wondering about the significance of the women being there. Why does this matter? Why do you say that this is a, a great thing? Well, let me explain this with two points. First, these verses are significant because they respect women in a, society, in a society that did not. We live in a day today that has different societal values than those in the past. But the Bible makes sure to tell uh, its readers which women were there as Christ died. In fact, later on in Matthew's Gospel, uh, women will be mentioned as witnesses to both the burial and the resurrection of Christ. What does this tell us? 
It tells us that God cares very much for women. and does not want them to be forgotten and pushed aside. Both men and women are made in the image of God, and despite being made differently, neither should be discriminated against. Second, we can see the faith of these women. Mary Magdalene, Christ's mother also, uh, uh, who also was named Mary, and John's mother all had tremendous faith. Have you ever considered this? From what the Bible tells us, there were only uh, one. Uh, there's only one apostle present at the crucifixion, John. Yet here were these three women who stuck with Christ until the end. They didn't run. They didn't abandon Christ. We could learn a thing or two from these women. When the apostles scattered, the women in our text were there for Christ. Well, those verses contain quite a bit of narrative, don't they? We could probably make a whole series out of that text, talking about each one in great detail. Yet those verses explain the most in, in important event of human history, perhaps um, tied with the resurrection and significance. As Ryle puts it, there was never an event on which so much depended. So, what's the, uh, what's the takeaway? What do we make of this? Well, it seems that nobody expected such an event on Golgotha that day. Just as the crowd was not expecting these marvelous things to happen, the unregenerate person does not expect the word of Christ to move them to faith. Just as the centurion had a moment of clarity when he realized that Christ is the Son of God, the unbeliever will often be convinced of the truth uh, without seeking it out themselves. Sometimes it's a long process, other times it's very quick. But the truth remains the same, that they did not do the seeking. It's only after God works in the heart of an unbeliever that they come to faith. It is as Christ said in John 6.44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So then, if you have not already, turn to Christ in faith so that you may be saved. He suffered and died on the cross for all who would believe, and he is your only way to heaven. Well then, if we have turned to Christ... Um, what do we take away then? We've read this passage uh, many times, I'm sure. Well, if we understand the significance of this event, if we trust in Christ for eternal life because of what he did on the cross, then we should rejoice. Our eternal future is secure. Therefore, our hearts should be lifted to such heights of joy, eternal life, Eternal peace with God. If you'll allow me, I'll quote our friend Ryle once more. He says, let us turn from the story of the crucifixion every time we read it with hearts full of praise. Let us praise God for the confidence it gives us and to the ground of our hope of pardon. Our sins may be many and great, but the payment made by our great substitute far outweighs them all. Congregation, I hope you see uh, the significance of this text. Nobody expected any of this to happen, but God greatly exceeded everyone's expectations. And he continues to exceed our expectations today. He blessed us tremendously by what he has already done. And I think when we get to heaven, our expectations will be exceeded even, even more so. We might have an idea of how good heaven will be. But I think it's going to be even better than anything we can think of. And that speaks to God's goodness. And that he blesses us and exceeds our expectations. Let us remember then what we're living for. We're not living for this life. We're not living for glory in this life and riches and fame and wealth in this life pleasure in this life. We're living for the next life. We're living for heaven. Then let us take up our cross and bear it. Let us do the work that we have been called to do, sharing this gospel and making disciples. That we can one day with a clear conscience stand before God and hear him tell us, well done, Not that we earn.
earn our own righteousness. 